Our guest today is Sarah K. Miller, a coworker of mine over at Domo. When I met her over a year ago, I was immediately blown away by her sense of understanding of design so early in her career. Time has proven that when Domo hired Sarah Kay, they truly found a diamond. Um, she's blown everyone away and holds so much credibility in her craft. The other thing that really caught my attention was how giddy she got when talking data viz. Seriously, I've never met someone who geeks out so hard on data viz to the point where it's not uncommon that on the weekend, she's figuring out some sort of life event of her own to turn into a data-based visualization. Um, she and I both agree that she got so lucky when she found what she was really passionate for so early in her career. How did it happen? Many of us struggle for years to find what we're really passionate about. Her journey of discovering data viz wasn't a journey she hopes others go on. Uh, some pretty life altering events brought about this opportunity. And I think if you listen, you can find some of the parallels for what you could do to identify what you're really passionate about. That and much more about data viz all coming your way on this episode of Designed Today. Let's get started. Sarah Kay. Hello. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Super excited to be here. Good. And I've actually wanted you uh, to come on the show now for a while. Um, I, I've admired you uh, in what it is that you do as far as uh, skill set. Um, there are not very many people out there that I think possess the passion uh, in companion to the skill set yeah. that I see you have. Thanks. And uh I want to be able to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and then we'll jump into all the fun stuff about uh, what makes Sarah K so great. <laughs> great. <laughs> if that sounds good to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, your background, your schooling um, and how you got into this field. For those who are listening, they know that, you know, we work together at Domo, mm -hmm. uh, heavy on the data biz side. But mm -hmm. uh, let me know a little bit about your schooling, what you went through and how you got to be at Domo today. Yeah. So I am a native of Virginia Beach. Virginia. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, East Coast. So huh. Utah is a foreign, cold, far away from a beach place, and that's okay. Uh -huh. um, I went, came out here for school, so I went to BYU and knew I wanted to study graphic design, like okay. ever since I was 14 or 15, which is amazing. And so I pursued that at college, got into the program. How did you know it at such an early age? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I am a weird kid. I, I was mean, just. Were you always drawing? Or what was like the. My family's pretty artistic. Okay. So we always had sketchbooks and yeah. would draw. But uh, when I was, yeah, 13 or 14, I started making t shirts for conferences uh -huh. and things like that. And I would just volunteer to make any anything that needed like a logo or digital anything. I'd be like, I'll do that. And Very then cool. like yearbook, I was on yearbook too. And so when I was 16, someone was like, you know, this is like a career. Like mm -hmm. people do this. And I was like, this is a job <laughs> in my mind. And I was like, that's what I'm doing. So, okay. Yeah. So you got to BYU, yep. uh, you started doing the design courses. Mm -hmm. What was your experience going through that? Yeah. I loved the design program. It's, it was really rigorous. So I actually didn't get in the first time I applied. Uh -huh. I had to stick it out, work harder. Was it the BFA program? I didn't get into the BA program. So at BYU, there's a progression. You have to apply to the BA uh -huh. and then the BFA. Oh, okay. Um, and so I didn't even get into the first okay. cut the first time I applied. That's competitive. Um, it is very competitive. How you didn't get into that surprises <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, it was rough uh, okay. and shook me. And I was like, maybe I should study something else. But I was like, you know what? I'll give it one more chance, one more shot, apply and see. And I worked really hard and paid off. So got into the BA and then a year later got into the BFA, okay. which was even more rigorous and challenging, but exciting and great. And I really uh, loved that kind of environment. And what, how, like how long is that BFA program specifically? Um, so the BFA is typically a two year program Okay. and you start all together with a cohort of classmates and you all take the same classes uh -huh. together for two years. And was that during then your senior year? Um, so I got into the BFA my senior year, so okay. I was on track to graduate in five years. So I know a little bit more of the story, but for those who are listening, tell me about your senior year. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of my senior year, well, midway through my senior year, okay. I got engaged actually, which was super exciting. And, uh, I was very happy to find this lovely man. Uh -huh. And so we halfway through, I got engaged and started planning our wedding. 
at the end of the semester, we got married and immediately moved to New York City for an internship that I had uh, at a motion graphics studio or Mm -hmm. doing motion design at a studio Mm -hmm. in New York. And that was awesome. So our first four months of marriage, we were in a tiny hundred square foot studio apartment. Was it really that small? It was like about the size of this room. It was no way. Tiny. Oh, that's hilarious. It was hilarious. So, and we didn't even have, we had a mini fridge and, uh, it was, yeah, it was a wild time. Wow. But, uh, after living in New York for four months, we moved, well, near the end of that, we found a lump in my neck. Uh And so we were like, as soon as we get back to Utah, let's check this out. So during the first week of school, when we were back, so my super senior year, but the last year of the BFA, uh, we found out that I had cancer. And so I withdrew from school and uh, started getting, going to doctors and getting treated. So. And what type of cancer was it? Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. So not as serious as some other cancers, yeah. still a hell of a beast, but. Yep. Uh, One of my best friends from back home went through that as really well. Really Hodgkin's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was wild. They say the first year of marriage is the hardest. So. And you proved that, that right. We were like, oh yeah, that, that feels about right. <laughs> if you get cancer during the first year, it's hard. So. And what was your husband's reaction response for all that? Yeah. So he was also in school at the time. He's a, he was a math major. He just barely graduated. Yeah. So he was a math major and, uh, yeah, it was really hard on him too. So he withdrew from some classes, um, but kept, had a flexible part-time job that he was able to keep Yeah. and, uh, took me to all of my doctor's appointments, which yeah. was awesome. And so the professors that he was still in classes with, they knew that he had a wife with cancer and it was kind of crazy. He was like, He'd walk around campus and be like, man, like all these people look so healthy and happy and like they don't know that my wife has cancer. Right. And that's my life. So, I mean, obviously that doesn't quite tie into the uh, topic of conversation today, but I just I had to stop and ask about your husband because, I mean, that's just that's a tough that's a tough I mean, for you, for him. Yeah. I'm sure for your extended family. Yeah. uh, I mean, it's tough on everyone. Yeah. It's a trying experience. It was. Uh, So that caused you to slow down a little bit. A lot of it. Yeah. A lot of it. <laughs> yeah. And I did uh, not like slowing down. So that was really challenging to have to learn to be kind to myself mm-hmm. and uh, be okay not accomplishing or doing things all the time. Are you a task oriented person, like a to do list type of person? I do like to do lists. Yeah. 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 So I love getting things done. Yeah. I love uh, my family's always making things and doing, yeah. trying to be active and making stuff. So it was very challenging to slow down and uh, just do one or two things a day. But from what we were talking about yesterday, prior to obviously recording the show, the uh, the slowing down ultimately led you to discover a new passion of yours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So speak to me a little bit about that. So at the end of my internship, I was actually pretty burnt out on graphic design and I was physically tired and could feel that something was wrong. But also I was just mentally like I am over graphic design. I don't want to do this mm-hmm. anymore. And so I was really hard looking forward. I wasn't looking forward to this final year yeah. in school because I was just tired and done with it. So <laughs> dreams come true, I guess. I got cancer, withdrew, and didn't uh, <laughs> That's a didn't have attitude. to do uh, graphic design for a year. And it was awesome. I found that I still did some graphic design, mm-hmm. but um, mostly just took a break and didn't think about it. Mm-hmm. Um and so after I finished treatment, I'm in remission now. Everything is fine. Went well. Uh, I started thinking, okay, I want to go back. By the way. Oh, thank you. That's yeah. still awesome. It, it, I, I'm pretty proud. Good. We both are very you proud. You should be. We celebrate our chemoversary every year. So. And that was just recently, wasn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah, we started four years ago was the start of chemo. So Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but it was your husband's wasn't it his background in math that actually perked your interest in data viz yeah so while i was going through chemo i would try to keep up on what my husband was studying and Mm -hmm. interested in and with the math he started getting more into statistics and computer science and started showing me some interesting data viz things uh in the math world yeah and of course like i don't do math very well so uh, i didn't understand everything that he showed me but the idea of taking numbers 
and visualizing them, applying design principles to them was such an interesting and kind of novel thing. Um, and so it leading when I started, when I finished chemo and was coming back to school, I was like, you know what, I, I want to poke around on this more. And there was one data viz class in the graphic design program. Oh, really? Yeah. Taught by Ray Elder. Okay. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> uh, he was awesome and very passionate about the subject too. And it was a pretty small class, um, kind of like experimental a little bit, but I loved it. And so his class, did you take it before getting introduced to it via your husband or no, was it my husband after? had showed me something. So I was like, mm, I'm really interested in this, Okay, but I didn't know like where to find data viz or yeah. like, like, I think I probably Googled it a couple of times and was like, uh, okay, not really like finding like anything that stood out to me, especially yeah. as a designer. Yeah. I was really interested in like visually striking things. Yeah. And I had like seen some things on Pinterest that had come up in my field, uh, like Pinterest page. Yeah. But nothing that was like, this is what data viz is or how, how to do it, how to get into it. I get you. So I felt like an outsider a little bit, I guess. And I was like, uh, I'm interested, but I don't know how to break into this. And so that class was a great, a perfect introduction to data viz. Are they still running that class? Um, it, Ray has left BYU, so there's a different professor who's gearing up to teach it next year. Yeah, cool. Uh, and then uh, I guess, long story short, you're now here at Domo. Yeah, and with this data viz, with this data viz <laughs> passion, you were a shoe in for the job. Yeah, I've said this to multiple people at Domo, but I don't think they recognize. I mean, because as far as career goes, you're pretty early, aren't you? Yeah, the Domo is my first job out of school. So as far as career goes. You know, you're very early in your career. You've found something that you're passionate about and you've landed at a company that does exactly what it is that you're passionate about. Yeah. And I've said this to multiple people at Domo that I don't think Domo knew what they were getting when they hired oh. Sarah Kay. <laughs> and because, you know, sometimes hiring somebody right out of school can be a crapshoot, right? Totally. You have no idea what you could get out of this. It could sink. Uh, it could float. You just sometimes don't know. No matter how hard you push an interview, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. And so there is some sort of inherent risk in hiring somebody new. And that's why I say they had no idea what they had <laughs> oh, when thanks. Sarah came when Sarah Kay came in to interview. Oh, thanks. Um, you're talented. And one of the things that uh, I really, again, admired about what it is that you do is that your talent and your passion for data viz doesn't just stop at work. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, if you follow Sarah Kay on Instagram, where else do you post any of this stuff? Uh, I try to post on Twitter, but I usually forget. So. Yeah, that's how I am as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's harder. So if they follow your stuff on Instagram and maybe we can even plug that in the description or in the meta of the podcast, yeah. but uh, you are always doing stuff with data viz, even in your free time on your Saturdays, on your Sundays, you're still doing stuff with data viz. And that's the thing that I find really awe inspiring is the fact that you really are passionate about this. It's not a, Oh, I love data viz. So give me the job. Like you are passionate about this. Yeah. And I've thought over and over again, like how lucky yeah. she is to be able to have found what it is she's passionate about so fast in her career, so early in her life. It's cool. It's awesome. Do you recognize it as like, I don't want to call it a blessing, but do you recognize it as uh, lucky. Pretty, pretty awesome? Yeah, super awesome, super lucky. I, I feel really lucky that through a series of circumstances, I found this thing that is a great fit and I really love. And did you ever think, I mean, five years ago, did you think this was going to be your thing? No. I don't think I even knew what database was. <laughs> Legitimately, I didn't either until I started at Domo, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to some extent, I still don't know what it is. I mean, you're much more uh, uh, talented in that department. Um, but, you know, I think it is very cool. And we're going to dive into a little bit about discovering what that passion was uh, and how others can discover what that passion is. But I want to plug one more thing. Hmm. Uh, you've got a meetup group. Yes. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about that as well. Yes. I just started a meetup group. Yeah. Called yep. Utah Data Viz. It is what it, the title says it is. It the is name of the group. just that. It's just straightforward. Um, I, so after my class ended at BYU, I really missed having a community of mm -hmm. other people who were interested in data viz that I could talk to about or bounce ideas off or get feedback on projects I was working on. I really missed that. And there's a couple of people at Domo that I can do that with now, mm -hmm. which I love. But uh, yeah, I just wanted more 
more of a sense of community, especially locally. Yeah. I'm really active and try to follow just about everyone who posts about DataViz on Twitter. Yeah. And that's where I get a lot of news and updates and um, cool ideas or projects that are being yeah. done. But I just wanted something, yeah, local that I could meet people face to face, talk about DataViz. We can all be passionate and geek out together. And so you started this meetup group. You've got uh, you've got one down, another one coming up here shortly. Yeah. And I, I imagine they're going to keep rolling out here in the future. Yeah, that's how, what we hope. Yeah. How often are you ho- holding them? Um, I mean, we started at the end of November, which is like prime time holiday season. Holidays time. Which yeah. I was like, at least we got one. Yeah. But after that, I was like, it was between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So it was kind of tricky. But yeah, I'm hoping every month or every other month. Cool. From here on out. So, so. if someone's interested in getting to know a little bit more about DataViz, they can find you on and find the information where? The meetup group. Cool. Just search Utah DataViz. Cool. And they can join in on the conversation. Yeah. Feel a sense of community. Is the community very large? Um, We had 26 people at the first meetup. For something as specific as DataViz, <laughs> so specific. that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Cool. We, I was pumped about that. Cool. So we're hoping to grow. And we're open to all sorts of individuals, designers, analysts, data scientists, anyone who likes DataViz can come, yeah. students. So I'm going to go back to this topic now of discovering what that passion was. Um, obviously, cancer mm-hmm. slowed you down a little bit yeah, and kind of forced you to take a breather yeah. and discover something new. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, your husband, who was in the math field mm-hmm. what's the right word yeah mathematics he's a yeah, mathematician he's a science guy can we say mathematician he's, or a, is math- that- he's a mathematician yeah. okay obviously that helps mm-hmm. uh, and that gave you some exposure but i want to know what what really advice you have or what uh your thoughts are for those who are trying to find their data viz you know yeah. or they're trying to discover what is it for them that they're really passionate about? What thoughts or advice do you have on that topic? Yeah, well, I think it's always kind of an iterative process. And if you're into UX, like, you know, you're always iterating Mm -hmm. things or design in general. Yep. And so I actually took a lot of inspiration from my husband. Um, He had six majors while in college. What do you mean? He switched majors six times. No way. (laughs) Okay. And so he started interested in like biotechnology or something like that and wound his way through psychology, anthropology, um, economics, Middle Eastern studies, and ended up in math. But through each of those majors, he found things that he liked about that and was like, oh, here's a principle from this. For Mm -hmm. example, he was an anthropology major and he's like, man, I love studying about like these ancient cultures are really cool, but what I really am digging is like just studying people in general. And so he kind of narrowed in on what he was interested in. And so from anthropology, he switched to psychology and from psychology, he was like, you know, actually it's not just people, but it's how they make decisions that I think is even more interesting. Mm -hmm. So from there he switched to economics and started studying how, uh, people make decisions with money and from there was like, you know, actually I love modeling how people make decisions. Uh And he was like, that's math right there. Interesting. Switch to math. So that iterative process helped him discover his passion. And you're thinking the iterative process also helped you stumble into data viz. Yeah. I mean, obviously he, he was there doing some data viz things on his own with math that I was exposed to, but um, seeing his journey through all these different majors kind of opened my eyes that like, oh, even though I found graphic design pretty young mm-hmm. and loved it and was like, this is my life, um, I still was like, oh, I should be open to other things. Like, maybe this isn't it. Maybe there's more that I could be interested in or do. And I think having that curiosity and yeah. open mindedness yeah. uh, can really lead you to unexpected places because I did not think that I would like I took a statistics class um, right. once I was passionate about data viz and I was like oh I love this you did like and that yeah I had yeah. a blast and then I took a computer science class and was like this is really cool too really hard but really uh-huh. cool because it lets me build the data viz things that I want and so being open to maybe other influences and like 
if I hadn't married a math major, probably wouldn't be hanging around math majors. Sure. And I might not have found this uh, place in sure. database. So. so if somebody is trying to discover what it is that they're passionate about, is it just searching what's out there and being naturally curious? I mean, what can they do outside of marry someone who's <laughs> going to be iterative as well? Yeah. Um, yeah. Curious. Um I think being open to new experiences. So maybe you go to a meetup group or uh, make friends with people who are interested in something you've never thought about before. Getting outside your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that can be a scary thing. As an introvert, I don't love doing that, but uh, I'm never mad when I do, I guess, or never upset about the results. When it's I do funny something. how, because I consider myself an introvert as well. And I run a podcast or I'm on camera. Crazy. You're an introvert and now you run a meetup group or you're in front of a group. What are you doing? It's funny how it just, oh. but it stems from passion, right? Yeah. Like yeah. I can overcome some of that anxiety because I, I found something that I really just enjoy digging into. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's probably the same for you? Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. So keeping your eyes open then, uh, experiencing new things, maybe not necessarily design related things, maybe yeah. just it's experience, maybe it's traveling. I know you do a bit of traveling as well, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd love. In fact, where were you guys just recently? We just did a road trip down to Arizona and California. So did some hiking, you did some mm-hmm. cool things, right? Hiking, camping, seeing friends. I mean, maybe this is even a little bit cliche because I think I already know the answer to this, but in nature or in just the world, like find inspiration. Yeah. Do you somehow gather inspiration as well and somehow tie that back into what you're doing? Yeah. I, I think filling the well is a really big thing. If you've ever heard that phrase, that that's why I take vacations and use up my PTO and travel and have meetup groups is because those things fill my well. Yeah. Like I need activities where I can get outside my regular routine and I love routines but it's great to take a break from that and go to a new place, visit new bookstores, yeah. see new things. I don't know. It's always can be very filling to experience different things like that. You know, and I've found as well that when you're actively looking for when you're actively looking to be inspired, there's a lot to be inspired by. Yeah. And. You know, my, I got an older brother who started taking photos just around Salt Lake, just, you know, throughout the day. Hmm. And he would just take some really cool photos of like, you know, whether it's architecture or, you know, just the beauty of, I don't know, fresh asphalt on the street, you know, Mm -hmm. just something like that, that when you see something like this or you see the texture of that fresh asphalt, you, you get inspired when you're looking to be inspired. Yeah. If you're not looking for it, they just become everyday things. Totally. But if you're looking to be inspired, there's a lot to be inspired by around us. Yeah. And if you start searching on the internet, there's a lot more to be inspired by. I mean, there's (laughs) artists everywhere that are just amazingly talented that you can find inspiration from. But even outside of the art world, uh, there's things to be inspired by. Yeah. Totally. That's cool. I wanted to uh, also take a couple minutes to maybe talk about your progression as a data biz designer. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've been doing this now passionately for a couple years. Yeah. So three years. It's it, about any, when I, I took the class was three years ago. Any idea on how many like projects that you've done just oh, on the side? That's like your weekend projects that I, I see you posting I about. Definitely have more unfinished projects than are posted. <laughs> OK. Um. I don't know, because some some are small and really quick and some are big and take a month or a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So it it really depends. Um, But I always have something cooking, I guess. But I probably have out there 10 to 15 maybe projects that I would feel proud of owning. Where can people find those if they want to take a peek at Uh, some of your work? Yeah, most of them are on my Instagram. Just just dig real deep. I'm working on updating my website to have more of my database stuff all in one spot. But, cool. You know, that's that's a task. So it always and is. It's it's either do that or make database. And I usually just make database instead that's of right. updating my website. So I've had podcasts now where we talk about resumes and we talk about <laughs> websites and portfolios. And I'm always reluctant to talk about those topics because I haven't gone back and revisited mine no. in so long. It's, and that is just like. 
I'm not passionate about resumes. <laughs> no. I'm not passionate about portfolios. Yeah. Uh, but they're good topics nonetheless. Yes. Um, so through the progression, let's say you've done these 15 data viz projects that's on your own. Have you picked up on things that you've improved upon now over the years from your first couple to today? Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that and what it is that you've picked up on and even, improved on. I even remember the first project that I started on and um I was designing, it was a project about how often people hug each other. Uh And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I got a really fun data set for my friends. Uh, And as I was visualizing it, I had one piece in particular that was a histogram. So like a lot of bars bumping up. And I was like, oh, it'd be so cool if instead of it being an actual histogram, that all the different data parts were kind of overlapped on each other. And it would like create They're this hugging. cool color. Uh-huh. Yeah, just like, you know, this overlapping effect. Uh-huh. And so I like did that and I was like, yeah, it looks awesome. But then as I showed it to my professor, he helped me understand like it may look cool, but it's not really conveying the data anymore. Like you can't see the actual amounts of data that it's trying to convey. And so that was like a tipping point for me where I was like, oh, like data viz has this responsibility yeah. of communicating accurately yeah and as a designer i obviously came from it from the visual perspective and uh so one of the big things that i've keep learning actually is how to accurately represent data so learning a lot from statistics Mm -hmm. in particular on ways that you should (laughs) typical ways that data is presented or um ways that may visually look cool but aren't as accurate so for example another example is um area so a lot of times if you see um like a square like a square tupperware yeah you're like okay i think i could fit about this much in it sure but if you have a rectangle tupperware is it the same area volume. as that square? Yeah, yeah, volume. Like we're humans are really bad at estimating that. Yeah. And so in data viz, when you have are using shapes like that to represent data, you have to be really careful about like That's how accurate analogy. do people need to be to like digest and understand these. Things. Right. Because if it just becomes a visual, now you've lost the whole reason you started the project. Right. So right. there's still this function. There's still the value that needs to be gleaned out of out of this data that's been mined. And now what you're trying to represent. Yeah. Do you find yourself, uh, I don't know, with the balance between the two, like I don't want to call it form and function, but maybe that's a little bit of what it is. Yeah. Is that ever a hard line to toe? Totally hard. <laughs> is it? Yeah. As a designer, I all the time want to just kind of do shortcuts or hide certain data points in order to make it pretty Uh or uh, more visually appealing. And so it's really hard to be like, okay, like I, I can lie with this data, but that is not great either. So yeah, yeah, trying to find that balance and learn more about the statistics side of things and the statistical history. I mean, there's this whole long history of statistics that's amazing and we can draw from because they've got things figured out. And as designers, yeah. like uh, we may think we know a lot, but when we look at the history, I, I don't know, at least personally, I learn a lot and I'm like, oh, that, that's why we don't do this or yeah. this is less effective than these you, other ways. You know, what's funny is you just triggered something in my memory uh, when we, had, we were having a staff meeting and you came and you presented some stuff on data viz and you brought that book. Mm-hmm. What was that book called? What was it? Uh, I think Data Portraits. The, the work of W.E.B. Du Bois. Yes. Yeah. And as you were presenting it, you were, and I don't, this is not, I don't mean this as an offense at all, but you were totally nerding out over this stuff. Oh, yeah. And as somebody who's not as passionate about data viz, I was just like, I mean, I kind of laugh a little bit at it, just go, not laughing at you, but laughing at the fact like somebody really does find that much joy in this. <laughs> yeah. And the thing that I really love about it, and I go, this is what I've admired. Is it so natural for you? It's mm. not a show. It's not a front. Like you were totally. genuinely just enthralled by the work that you were presenting there. And it, again, I just think it speaks to, uh, you know, finding your passion and yeah. then figuring out how to do that passion full time. That's amazing. Well, thanks. So if we have that takeaway of understanding that line between form and function or mm-hmm. how to make sure that this uh, visual still speaks what it's trying to represent without jumping over to the other side of the line and just making it pretty. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great takeaway. Is there anything else maybe that you've discovered over the course of these last couple of years in doing the data viz that 
uh, you think you've improved upon? Um, honestly, my process with DataViz has been really similar to learning graphic design, where I would just make a lot of shit, mm-hmm. <laughs> make a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And through that iterative process, again, I guess by churning out lots of work, I can quickly learn from my mistakes and uh, move on to more interesting things yeah. or be like, oh, okay, I learned about histograms. Now I won't make that mistake again. Sure. Let's move on to other chart types and other ways of displaying information. And you've done a lot of, um, I mean, speak to me a little bit about some of the projects that I've seen where you actually have to start coding up a lot of different projects or pieces of the project. Mm-hmm. Is that new to you or is that something you've been doing for two years? Mm, coding is, I have a, a hot and cold relationship with coding. <laughs> I It's really, really difficult for me. Um, and sometimes I like that challenge and sometimes I don't. So I try to rotate data viz pieces. So lately I've been really frustrated with code. So I've done a lot of pieces I've seen by the recent hands. one that you've done by hand. Yeah. And that is great, but it is so tedious. Yeah. <laughs> and you get really familiar and intimate with your data when yeah. you do it by hand. Yeah. And I, I have loved that. But there's also, I've got a list of pieces that are just too big, too much data to do by hand. Uh, and what are you coding in? Um, I, a couple different places. So I usually start with uh, processing. It's a library built on Java. Okay. And it was designed for artists, which is okay, cool. awesome. Uh, so I use that a lot, especially for static pieces. But lately I've been trying so hard, <laughs> trying and repeatedly failing, but still trying um, to learn D3, which is a JavaScript library Very for cool. visualizing things. And if you weren't as passionate about data as you probably would have given up I by now. I probably would have given up. And I I take breaks because it is frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a couple months since I've touched Sometimes it's JavaScript. good to walk away from it, though. Yeah, definitely. That's cool. Yeah. Well, with, uh, with not a whole lot of time left, I do want to give you just one more second. Uh, go ahead and plug your meetup one more time, what they should be searching for, uh, and your Instagram account. I'll leave that in the yeah. description, but... Instagram account is uh, the Sarah K. The Sarah K. The Sarah K. Yeah. Um, we'll look that up, and then I meet up. The group was called Utah Data Viz. Utah Data Viz, and I'll yeah. have that information Find in the us. description. Look for our purple logo. It's and you great. cranked that one out yourself, I yeah, imagine. I did. Good for you. Uh, yeah. The, the pros of being a designer, you can brand your meetup group. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it the way you want to do it. Exactly. That's exactly. awesome. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. A lot of good takeaways, I think, for uh, people who are trying to find their passion or trying to find more information on data viz. Uh, they should definitely check out the meetup group, meet group if that's the case. But uh, again, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's it for today.